was I remember that my father used to have this giant like shortwave radio because he used to be a merchant marine and he used to go on the ships all the time. So he would have a shortwave radio on the, on the ship so that he could hear music from around the world. The very first time he brought it home, I was about eight years old, and all I remember was David Rose's The Stripper was playing. You know that? Da 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 da. And when you're eight years old, you just grab the doorknob and just. There's something special about you, right? I was just skipping through Galveston trying to be fabulous, right? Welcome to Closet Cases podcast where LGBTQ comedians and performers tell their coming out and transitioning stories. Today we have Keith Price. You probably know him from his gig on Sirius XM Radio or his documentary Ebony Chunky Love. Uh, he's originally from Galveston, Texas, and he has a hilarious story about his obsession with West Side Story. Take a listen. Picture this. Ten years old, Sunday morning, supposed to go to Sunday school because we black growing up in Texas, didn't go because I wasn't feeling well. <laughs> Million dollar movie, Channel 13, KTRK, Houston, Texas, anybody from Texas that you should know. Million dollar movie, West Side Story. Oh. Rita Moreno, Natalie Wood, oh. Joyce Shakiris. God bye bye. All I remember was, 10 years old, we're in the big scene at the end. There's Maria running to Tony. Tony's running to her, and then that son of a bitch Gino shoots him. Kills him! Right there in that damn park space! She runs out and feels me like a baby! Then she's like, is there another woman that these guns on me, Gina? I was 10. I was transfixed. She took me on the emotional journey that I didn't even know I was supposed to go on at 10 years old. And then, don't forget about all the fucking dancing! Is your tape from what? <laughs> you better work. Hey, Keith, thank you so much for doing this. Sean oh my God. Darling, are you kidding? Thank you for having me. Oh this God. is so much fun. Thank well, you. You are so much fun. I thought your set was spectacular at Stonewall. Oh. You killed it. You closed out the show. It was oh. like fireworks right I mean, at the well, end. You know what's so funny? Because you had me close out the show, and I didn't know I was the closer. And then it was like, oh, my God, I haven't closed the show in a long time. What's the protocol? Because there's a protocol yeah. closing the show. You have to kind of talk about what you saw because you've been there all <laughs> evening. Technically, you didn't just waltz in. And then you just, you know, you just hope that whatever you say it works. <laughs> and it did. You destroyed. It was amazing. Uh, People standing ovation. It, it was beautiful. It was great. But it was a great night, though. What a great show to be a part of. Yeah. No, yeah. The, the It's like the redo uh-huh. of Closet Cases after an eight-year hiatus. Well, you're 2.0. Oh, yeah, exactly. 2.0. 2.0 with Keith Price. Because oh, I remember doing the first one. Yeah. But I was like, I, you know who was in that show, too? Kate McKinnon. Kate McKinnon, yes. The Emmy Award winning Kate McKinnon. Exactly. She, so, yes. she used to do the show. I'm trying to think of anyone else of fame. Like some people think they're famous that done the show, but not not like to Kate McKinnon famous. Like me. Like you, like Keith Price. I, such a get. get. Well, you know. You know. I'm so easy, though. That's the thing. <laughs> That's what she said. Oh. Speaking of easy, I, I love your ease of storytelling, which is... Which is so amazing, and I and the joy you have from storytelling. But what I love the West Side Story is that you know you you currently are really into musical theater. You have your podcast, yeah. The Curtain Call, yeah. Keith Price Curtain Call. Was that something you were into as a child? You know, it, the theater stuff. It, it's funny. It's like when I talked about the West Side Story moment. That was that like that period of between like eight, nine, ten, and eleven, where most young boys are playing sports. Most young boys are doing all kinds of things. And I remember trying. Sports and like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> this track thing is terrible. I'll have to be here after school. Uh. <laughs> and and so I found, you know, I think I found that niche. And and one of the things too that I don't usually talk a lot about is at that age, I was like, you know, in the middle of my own personal, you know, childhood traumas, you know. Yeah. It's it's odd that you know, even in in my national radio career, I never talked about having that Me Too moment. But I was I was a child of that. And oh it, wow! And, and it was 
it, it's so funny because I, I can't believe I'm even sitting here telling you this now. But it's sort of like that was that was a part of the thing. And I think that what I found was escape through entertainment. Mm-hmm. And that was like, a, you know, every sitcom that came out at the time. Because I was a kid of the 70s. Right. So every fabulous sitcom, every fantastic variety show, all of those things appeal to me in a world of escape. And then I think like the gay stereotype of why you love all of that stuff came after, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's escapism first and then your taste level as a, as a gay child. It it developed. Right. You know, and I, I feel like the idea of having a sense of good comic timing came from watching all of those shows. Not, not realizing that that was, that I was being indoctrinated enough, if that makes sense, right. to be funny. Like, yeah. like, oh, you learn early how to channel things into pain, channel the pain into something that's going to make you laugh, channel the pain somewhere else, so that you don't have to f- focus on that. And and I think that that was a lifesaver. So I don't know. I don't wow. know if it was if it was if I knew then, like I said, you know, because we all that night we were all talking about those triggers that we had, like you right. unicorns. Let me come right. on now. <laughs> like, but but it's it is it, it's like you don't think of those things as oh my god you're going to be a big homer when you're in your twenties, right? Twinking out and tweaking out, you know, you know, <laughs> you don't think that at eight, you know, right? You're just like oh my god, I love the ropers. I love the ropers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I learned every, all my comic timing from Mrs. Roper. Roper. <laughs> the unsatisfied Mrs. Roper. Oh, the unsatisfied Mrs. Roper. Oh, Audra Lindley. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you, now afterwards, did you study theater or? No, I never studied theater. I actually was a biology pre med major when I was at UT Austin. And oh, then, wow. Right That's... towards the end, when I had the big electives to take, I took uh, dramatic performance of literature. And it was a black theater class. Nice. did a lot of black theater things. um, In the class, I did a monologue from uh, the Colored Museum and George (laughs) Wolf's Colored Museum. And one of the the character I picked was Miss Raj. And it was the gospel according to Miss Raj. And she was like this fierce black queen just living her dream. And I remember, and I was in college and I hadn't come out. I wasn't out yet either. And I remember going, I don't know, but the thrill just speaks to me in such a way. <laughs> and it was like, I remember my tight dance pants. I had like the 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 t-shirt or the shirt with the the knot tied up, acting all fabulous. <laughs> with, and then the in the monologue, I remember it was that he had had the the hairs of his legs cornrowed to spell Miss Raj. And so I did, of course, I didn't have long enough hair to do all that. So I wrote Miss Raj on the outside of my thigh. So when I got to that part of the thing, I just picked up my leg and went, ow! <laughs> and the class was like, great. And it was like, and then I knew at some point there was that connection that I would never let go. And then it just kind of stayed dormant until I moved to New York. And then it was able to really blossom. And then it was able to learn about theater here. Where right. You know, things were actually happening. And then those people whose names I might have heard about when I was living in Texas is like, oh, my God, they're like down the street from me. You know, right. And then it all kind of just fell into place. And then when I started working in radio, it wasn't until I was about seven years into the 10 year career that I was able to talk about theater and do, you know, make the conversation and have a show where I was doing it. And then when it ended, I just grabbed it and took it right with me to this podcast. So, I mean, I've maintained that love of it. And the more that I get to experience it, it's even more exciting to talk about it when people actually ask you, like, what did you think of the show? Well, <laughs> let's just start with the costumes. <laughs> you know, first, the entrances. Oh, my God. You know? and, and then it becomes that serious conversation about what it represents to you. Because interesting that we're talking about, uh, you know, being out and gay and stuff in this, this podcast and, and as comedians and actors. But just last night, I went to, or recently actually, I went to the open dress rehearsal, or the invited dress rehearsal for Torch Song Trilogy. Oh, or Harvey Weierstein. just Torch Song. Harvey Weierstein? Oh, no. Harvey, oh, wait, what oh, am I saying? Weierstein, <laughs> I'm trying to put Harvey Weinstein and Firestein together. I should be excommunicated exactly. right now from the gay But you know, I have a picture of me with Harvey Weinstein, and you didn't grope me. Go figure. Anyway, so, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I was thinking, what was I saying? Oh, so... I saw that show last night, uh, and it was interesting because I remember seeing the movie when I was in college before everything blossomed. The Matthew Broderick. With Matthew Broderick and um, uh, Ken Page, Marsha Dimes, and uh, just a whole host of people. Brian Kerwin, I think it was, playing uh, the Ed character. And it was... 
as I was watching the show, I kept thinking, oh my God, well, it's kind of dated. You know what I mean? Because it's kind of yeah. set in the 70s. And as I was watching it, it was like the conversation about coming out and the conversation of dealing with your family and the conversation of trying to forge your way, knowing that people are saying that you're one sort of way because you are gay, but yet you're trying to live your life in a way that makes you happy. And it was like, I never put that together that deeply before when I saw that because I was still in my own personal closeted turmoil. Right. But then when I saw it on screen, it was like, oh, huh. And I kind of held on to that. And then when I was able to come out, I was able to have my conversations. And then to see it last night, it was like, it's amazing to think that even in this day and age, 2018, we're still, people are still scared. People are still frightened. People will lose their lives and jobs. And now that the government seems to kind of be taking us back another 15, 20, 30, 80 years, it's like it makes you scared as a person who is living your life out and free because the the life that you're living is offensive to somebody and they're trying to stop you from living. Right. And, you know, it's it was different when I was in my 20s. And now that I'm, I'm you know, 51. <laughs> You just have to say it. You just say it. <laughs> that that now that I'm over that particular hump, I look at life a little bit differently now, and I just it makes me sad to think that now people are living like that because I, you know, the, being able to sit here with you right now is because I was brave enough to say that I was gay, however many years ago that was, but April seventeenth, nineteen ninety three, when I was able to finally say it and be okay with whatever the consequences of it were, I was able to say I'm I'm a homosexual. Now, what do I do with my life? And because of that, and because of the love of the performing and the comedy, and I was able to find a way, I think, to make my life work for me. Yeah. And make my life work in this world with everybody else. And I managed to get along with everybody else as a gay man. So I don't understand why you know straight people can't do it either. You're like, exactly. get, along get with over everybody. it. Just get over it. Yeah. I don't want to sleep with you unless you're available. <laughs> you know? Or, you know, if you're on the DL, you can still call me. Just keep your mouth shut. Anyway, so <laughs> this moment should have been the one that really, you know, just, I think, pull it all together. Watching Wonder Woman. Oh. Because I'm old, right? Watching Wonder Woman, right? She's doing her thing. I was already living for the whole spin around costume change thing, right? We all live for that, you know. Boom, and there she is giving you headbands, lasso, bullets on the, the, the bracelets, the whole thing, you know, the panties with all the stripes and shit on it. So stars on the panties, the eagle front, whatever. You know what I'm talking about for those of you, right? But I thought that that was all she had to give to us as kids, right? First season, it was just a circle, and then she wound up with a close in her hand, right? Second season, they streamlined the whole process, right? She does the full spin, then there's the burst, and then boom, right? But nobody prepared me for the double turn in which she went from just a shiro in Nicole Austin with the boots and shit. As she's running to the motorcycle, she realizes she can't wear it because she's gonna burn her inner thigh on the motorcycle. So what does she do? Another turn and has on a motorcycle outfit. Hey, but the shit gets better. Another episode rolls around. I thought I was losing my mind then, and then the bitch comes out. Honey, she's running into some place in the forest chasing after some man, bad guy. I don't even remember if he's a Nazi or something, but she's chasing the motherfucker. Chases him in, can't catch up to him, sees a horse, does another turn, honey, and has on a full-on equestrian outfit. Riding crop and the boots. Fuck you. How did that bitch do that? But wait, it got even better, and then it's when I finally fell out. I was probably about 12. This bitch, Linda Carter, turned me the fuck out. Why? As Diana Prince, she runs to catch after this man. This man is crazy. He's got like a bomb. He's gonna like throw it in the water. It's gonna turn into this big old thing. It's gonna like to be a mine. They're gonna kill people, right? This bitch chases this son of a bitch down to the end of the thing. She's running to the end of the whole pier, gets to the pier in her Diana Prince ensemble, right? Realizes that she's gotta jump into the water 
to catch the bomb to save the world, right? And what does Miss Diana Prince do, honey? She gives you da na 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 one turn, pow! Hey, look, she's Wonder Woman, but she doesn't stop. She does another turn right after she did the first turn to turn into Wonder Woman to put on a full-on scuba diving outfit so she can jump into the water and save the world. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I know that a lot of gay men love Wonder Woman. What do, what do you think? What do you think it's about her that's that gay men find so appealing? Uh, what is that, well, I that mean, piece? You, you know, okay. All right. So I have had the pleasure in my career to talk to so many fabulous people. And when you meet people like Linda Carter, yes. who, as you hear, bitch was feels. Okay, come on. What? She did what? She changed her clothes. We didn't even see her draws. I mean, it was all kinds of stuff that was going on. But I think one of the things about Wonder Woman that I think most gay men will, uh, will probably own is the fact that she had to keep her superpower hidden. Mm, and that's so you know, and I think that good. we as you know folks of the LGBT, we tend to keep our powers hidden, and we keep mm. our and and the the power is that we can stand in our truth. That's our power. That's our 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 you know um, magic bullet bracelets and our lassos <laughs> of truth, and our headbands with the fierce little stars on them. Like that is what I think that represents, and so. On a, I guess, a subconscious psychological level, that's why it, I think it appeals, especially to gay men. And again, right. costume change, hello. <laughs> I know. Well, I, not one, but two, honey, I and one spin. I was Come dying when you went into the two, the double spin. <laughs> the double spin. <laughs> that was so hysterical. But then it's like, and now, even now, you can stop and you flash and you think about it and you're like, oh my God, that's right, she did do that. You know, you're just like, <laughs> that was fabulous. And it's like, but can you imagine when you see it for the first time at, 11 or 12 and you think it's fabulous but you don't know why it's fabulous right you know what i mean but do you think like uh, i mean similarly superman has a he does keep a secret as well and but his yes. his change is a little bit more boring where he goes inside of a phone booth right he goes inside of a phone booth it's not flashy enough right i mean thank god he's hot when he comes out so it's <laughs> worth that. i think clark ken's pretty hot i don't think he would have got it <laughs> I would, are you kidding? You know, I have a friend of mine, and if he's listening, because we, we haven't been speaking as of late, but it's been my fault, and I own that. But I have a friend of mine who, to me, is idyllically a Clark Clint Kent type. Yeah. Like, you know, down to the glasses, down to him being kind of nerdy, <laughs> but he's hot. You heard that when I'm telling everyone you're hot. <laughs> you are. Well, we'll post his profile <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> tell him that Keith said that I, he wanted you to die. I want you all individually to tell my friend Lynn that he's hot. That's what I need for him. He needs a boost. So what all our listeners are saying right now is, hey, Lynn. Hey, Lynn. How's it going? But what I love, and too. <laughs> and he bakes. And he bakes. He bakes and he's hot and nerdy all at the same time. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I love that you actually have met one. Linda Carter in real life. Yeah. How was that for you? Did you get to oh. sort of express your emotions? I did get to tell her that, because I, I remember asking her that same question about why she felt it was that way, and she kind of gave that same answer. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, girl, it's about the double turns. Because <laughs> we love that. And she thought, oh, that's an odd thing. But she also admits that she didn't know that it was going to be that big of a thing and how it was going to carry on for her to still have a career where queens are like literally falling down at her feet when she walks by. <laughs> she had no idea. <laughs> it's a gig. You know, we're actors too. It's a gig. Right. I didn't know it was going to be that impactful for you, but <laughs> yay, you don't forget me. So she, but she was amazing. I mean, and that was the thing about that job though, was like every other day or so you'd wind up meeting somebody who for some reason is um, an influencer, is some, mm -hmm. that has had some sort of impact on you. You know, especially for me in my life in Texas, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, Linda Carter. Oh my God. Like when I met Rita Moreno from yeah. my story, it's like the same thing. Like, oh my God. She's, hey, you guys to me. Oh, from yeah. The company. She's everything that Anita is supposed to be, even though I still love me some Cheetah Rivera. Hey, Cheetah. <laughs> um, but I wasn't, I didn't get to see it. I'm sorry. I didn't see her do that. But it is. Those are those moments where it's like, oh, my God, it's like everything you ever thought about in your childhood happening like that and having these people just cross through your lives and and being able to tell them like telling Joan Rivers that she 
is single-handedly one of the reasons why I think I actually became a comedian when it was all said and done. And I mean, what an odd thing to have her here from a big old giant black queen. Oh my God, girl! <laughs> you really broke me up. Can we talk? You know? And, and it was, I think having that moment Ultimately, I think was the full circle to wanting to continue to try to have a life in comedy or have a life in performance because, you know, she never stopped working. Yeah, she to the day she died. The, till the literally till the day she died, she was working. So, you know, a great example of someone to to hopefully follow in the footsteps of somewhere, or at least to say has been one of the influences that I've personally have had the context of meeting. <laughs> Clearly, in my formative years, there was something going on, and Keith Price wasn't really sure, but life goes on, you figure shit out, right? So, we'll fast forward now, because there have been several other incidences that I realized that I could share with all of you, but it'll just, you know, yeah, Keith, get on to it, you're gay, you're gay, you're gay, you're gay, you're gay, right? So, I'm gonna spare you the full coming out in Seattle, you know, after hanging out with a friend that I hadn't seen in eight years, a new friend says to me, hey, look at this, you two guys suddenly even haven't seen each other in eight years, and look, you, me, him, we're all gay. <laughs> um, I don't think so. <laughs> but what? Like, what about me that says gay at 26? What about me that says gay? So he says it to me, and then all of a sudden I had this realization, and it was just like, did anybody see the movie Foul Play with Goldie Hawn? Yes. 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 Okay, so you remember the scene with the albino? <laughs> the albino chases her through the movie, and then at one point, she's in the house. Not only does she have the albino on one side, but then she got the crazy guy with the scar, chasing her around, trying to get the cigarette packs. It's a lot of mess going on. <laughs> Snakes, everything. Burgess Meredith, the penguin, all up in this movie. All of these motherfuckers up in the movie, right? Honey, Goldie Hawn sees the guy with the scar. He scares the shit out of her. She fights, she fights, she takes the knitting needle, stabs him, thinks, oh my God, I gotta save myself. Runs to her San Francisco apartment to this kitchen, which was delightful. The kitchen was gorgeous. She goes into the kitchen. She calls the police and she's like, She turns around. You know how those, those doors, the country kitchen doors, that have like the two levels where you can open the one top and the bottom? Well, all of a sudden, the top part flies open. There he is, Mr. Albino, right? With a knife. But as she's freaking out, she sees the albino, then she looks down the hallway, and then the crazy guy that had the scar with the thing, he gets up and he starts walking toward her. So you got albino over here, crazy broad man kind of walking towards her. She freaks out and just faints. But it was all about the slow faint. It was like she stopped, she screamed, and then in slow motion she just circularly fell. It was slow. The camera spins. And it was like, hey Keith, you're gay. What? <laughs> so that was pretty much coming out in Seattle at the 17th, 1993. 25 years this year, baby. Happy 25th anniversary. <laughs> well, thank you. Good for you. Thank you. you don't look a day over 20. Oh, you look amazing. <laughs> So now, so you came out at 26. Yeah. And I, I love your slow faint into it. <laughs> uh, it. Do you feel like it sounds like when that person just came, they said, oh, you're one of those yeah. gay people. Is that your realization or did you, well, you know, know it bef was, beforehand? It was, okay, here's, here's the, a backstory piece for that whole story. Okay, so I did go to Seattle. I did go to meet a friend of mine who I knew was gay mm. because he had come mm -hmm. out to me because he'd gotten kicked out of the Navy. And in that time that he was in the Navy, I had met this my friend David, who I will call my friend David. It's him. He loves me. <laughs> Davo. Hi. And we were doing um, a, a beer hunter thing for Miller Beer. And we ended up being in Milwaukee together for training because they had all these actors that would go into the bars and be like, woo, drink Miller Beer, woo, <laughs> throw them beer and throw them prizes. And so um, I was doing that in Texas. And so I, it just so happens that the training had to happen in Milwaukee. And so 
I remember distinctly walking down the hallway and I was humming to myself. I was humming a song from Eight Misbehaving. Looking good, I'm oh, yeah. feeling fine and bringing over you. And <laughs> as I was walking, somebody else behind me started singing along and it was my, my now friend David, but at that time I hadn't really met him. And then there was a moment when uh, we went to go do our, uh, our set. We were going to go see a group of people do the thing that we were supposed to be getting paid to do. And <laughs> we got out of the bus. It was Milwaukee. Uh, yeah, February, Milwaukee, 1993. And, oh, sounds like torture. Right? And it was freezing. <laughs> and I, of course, being, having lived in Texas most of my life, had no snow game. So when the snow and the ice hit the floor, I'm like, how do you walk in this? How do you walk in this? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What do we do? And I almost fell. And I remember David happened to be coming up behind me because we'd all gotten off of the bus around the same time. And when I slipped and almost fell, he caught me and oh. put me up, right? So now you flash forward a couple of months later, and he and I have been corresponding, and he was telling me about you know his partner, his partner, his partner. And stupid asked me, I'm like, oh my God, he's got a business too? <laughs> <sighs> That's crazy. So that went on for Jenkins months. Jenkins and Jenkins. Jenkins and yeah, Jenkins, yeah. yeah, you know. And so that went on. And so then in the interim, I, I re, you know, reconnected with my friend of eight years, and I said, hey, listen. I met this friend of mine. He's great. He told me I can come and, and you know do my birthday in Seattle. And I was like, what a perfect opportunity to come and see you. So then I get to Seattle to find out not only have my new friend is living in the gay section of Seattle, but my old <laughs> friend is in the gay section of Seattle, but like eight blocks away. Oh, wow. It was like, what? And so then it was like coordinating, coordinating, coordinating. And then we wind up getting together. We were making plans to go out and my friend was working. And so we all went to my friend's job. And it wasn't until David said, look at this, you guys, you haven't seen each other in eight years. And look, you're bu- everyone, we're all gay. And I was just kind of standing there going, <laughs> I don't think that I'd established the gay thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was just like, oh, my God, Keith, what kind of denial were you living in? And I remember the night before, I was a comedy sports improv person. And I was hanging out the night before my trip with the two other, three other gay guys that are in, what was in our troop together. We were mm-hmm. all together. And I used to hang out with them because, like, oh, my God, we'd have so much fun after the shows because we'd be <laughs> dancing and stuff. But, I mean, I would never come out with the guy. I mean, really, no, nah, not me. <laughs> and I will never forget the morning that I left that my friend said, he goes, I hope when you come back that you're a different person. That's what my friend oh. said to me at the time. And, you know, that next day, that's when it all went down. We were standing in this nursing home when my friend was working. He said it, and I just stood there, and I was like, oh, my God, maybe... Maybe I am just kidding myself. And I think that the faint moment was like that exhaustion of running so far away from it in my mind. Yeah. And I finally was just like, oh, oh my God, it's just, ah! <laughs> <laughs> And there you go, the spiraling camera. Yeah, like, <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> but, you know, that was that moment. And, and it was like, I went back to my friend David's house that night, and I was like, oh, my God, I know. <laughs> what am I going to do? I'm in Seattle. And this is the first day of my vacation. Right? Oh, wow. This is all happening the first so day. So here's a whole week of you oh, crying. Whole, i got five more days left. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, I can't. Do this. <laughs> okay. And I, I remember I lasted for like about a good, solid, maybe 15 minutes of some serious Oprah crying, <laughs> ugly cry up, the tears, the whole thing. And then right in the middle, I just realized, it's like, what are you crying for, you big homer? All right, now what? And so they're like, (laughs) so what are we going to do tomorrow? (laughs) And that was it. I go to Seattle, have a big coming out moment, fly back to Texas, living my life. I'm going to tell this friend. I'm going to tell that friend. Oh, my God, let me call my brother. Call my brother. Hey, guess what? (laughs) Faggot! See, because they used to beat me up as a kid because I was a baby. So eventually now, life goes on. I live in Austin for a few years, pull my shit together, do the comedy, think I'm gonna do something, come pull, pull my ass, York City. Get to New York, first job I get, bouncer in a strip club. <laughs> but not only bouncer, honey, bouncer, DJ, house mother, <laughs> MC. Oh, no. Honey, you can see what I did on that pole, baby. I'm a good choreographer. <laughs> Cause you gotta know how to pop it for that money. So, I got this job now at the strip club. I'm living my life in New York. I'm gay, I'm fabulous, I'm living on my own, right? I, what did I, do? I went home to Texas after being in New York for about a year, year and a half, right? Lost a little weight, because that's what you do, because you gotta walk every fucking place. 
They don't prepare you for that when you make the move. Anyway, so you walk everywhere. And then um, I shaved off my head like it is now, because I used to have hair, but I shaved off all my hair. And then I had like this naked man ear clip on my ear. <laughs> and on the right ear, because you know what? We were in the age of George Michael at that time. I could do whatever I wanted to do. You don't tell me what ear I can wear my shit in. Because that's the only way you can assert it when you know you're a big homo. Anyway, so, my, oh, okay. So, now I'm flying back to Texas. I've been in New York now. I've learned how to smoke pot. I mean, I didn't know how to do it before, but I finally got it on a regular. Um, Texas is so hard if you don't know people. Anyway, so, I fly back now. This is before 9-11. I got the pot. I got my one hitter. Yeah. The flight is delayed. So we get to Houston, get to Houston. There's no limousines to get me down to Galveston, which is about a 45 minute to an hour drive, depending on, you know, get you. So I have to get a cab. Get this cab driver. I don't know what his story was, but I get in the cab and I close the door and I'm feeling very New York. Very New York. We pull out, he tells me he's gonna drive me, it's gonna cost me 50 bucks, whatever. We pull out on the freeway and I said, hey, I smoke pot because I live in New York City now. You think I can smoke in your car? And he goes, only if you got something to share. Hey. So picture it, we driving down I-45. From Houston to Galveston, like fucking Cheech and Chong with this guy that time. <laughs> living, kids, living. Keith Price is in his zone, he's fabulous. You know, I'm living in New York, I'm a comedian, I'm finding things, you know, learning how to live my life. Get to my house in Galveston late. Show up, my dad's there, my mom's already asleep, and I'm high as a kite. So we get in the house, and my father's like, Okay, so tell me about New York right now. Because my father, many years ago, because both of my parents were um, immigrants from Honduras, and they lived in New York for many years, especially during the 60s and the early 70s. So they were there for a lot of the change, JFK, the whole, you know what I mean? They were all a part of that stuff. And so my father says to me, so, you like New York, huh? I was like, yeah. He goes, yeah. Now, mind you, bald, a little thinner, Naked man crawling up my hair. <laughs> and I'm high too, right? And my father looks at me and he says, You know, Keith, the more I look at you, the more and more you look like a faggot to me. Now, normally you would get offended, right? But I figured my parents, Latin American immigrants, he didn't call me a body corner at the table, so I'm good, right? We didn't have to translate, shit's cute. So when he said it to me, I went, really, daddy? I said, well, how do you feel about faggots? He goes, I don't really like them much. And I went, oh. So then I got up from the table, took my bag, went into the bedroom, pulled out my cell phone, because I had one Motorola flip of the thing with the pull up the bedroom. And I said, I had to call my friend Lynn, who I was going to visit in Austin. He's living in Paris now, side note. Fabulous, 6'8", love him. <laughs> anyway, so I called my friend Lynn, side note. Call my friend Lynn. I say, hey, listen, um, I just got back to the house, and I think my dad and I are gonna have a fight. And I, I just don't wanna do that, so I'm just gonna let you know, I probably might be coming to Austin tomorrow instead of staying here. I said, but it's gonna be late because I too have tickets to Gypsy at the fucking Opera House in Galveston. <laughs> And I don't give a shit, Dayo. You ain't making me miss Miss Bazeppa. <laughs> Fuck you. Shit. Your mother just a minute. When I feel it, take a look how different we are. If you wanna make it, tweak a while you shake it. If you wanna grind it, wait till you've refined it. And if you wanna bump it, bump it with a trumpet. Get yourself a gimmick and you are too. Blah, 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 blah. So needless to say, I wasn't going back to Austin just yet, all right? So I get up the next morning and I'm packed because I'm shit man. I gotta fake be nice to people all day long just so I can go see Gypsy later and then sneak out of the office in the middle of the night. So my father said nothing. Didn't mention it. Didn't bring it up. Went out and made me breakfast the next morning. And I'm like eating food going, hey. <laughs> but you put in these eggs. Because you never know, right? 
So, flash forward now, fabulous time at home. No problems. We didn't endure, didn't get crazy. I'm like, cool. Go to Austin, have a great time. Fly back to New York. Start my job that week, back in the strip club, right? Were you shocked that he didn't mention it again in the morning? I was, because like I said, I instinctively, you know, thank you, loving someone gay, because I was already ready to just go, you know what? I don't have to put up with you, motherfuckers. I can do whatever I want to do. I'm grown. I'm living in New York. I don't need you. know, I was already in that headspace just waiting for this man to say something to me. And he didn't say a word. Did not say good morning. He had breakfast made for me. Yeah, that sounds like an... A nice way to avoid having yeah. a real conversation. Yeah. And then it wasn't until after I got back that he asked. You know, and of course he went to my brother and asked him first. And my brother was like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Because <laughs> he didn't want to get involved. Right. Well, and I mean, it's good on him. It was good on him. Because then he would also have to explain, well, why does he feel that way? Where does he get all that anger from? Where is it? Because it was like, you know, because of him. And so he... He he did. He called me up that day at, at work. Now, the thing about being at the strip club, as I told you before, MC house mother, DJ, janitor, choreographer. Yeah. You gotta do it all. So anyway, so I happen to be in the box office. There's the phone. The microphone thing is right behind me. It was weird because the phone rang about 10, 15 minutes later. And at the place that I worked at, we have to change the dancers every 15 minutes. So... <laughs> So my father had a call, and I pick up the phone, and I'm like, hi. He's like, it's Keith there. I was like, hey, daddy, how you doing? Wait, hold on a second. Thank you, Cinnamon. <laughs> Coming to the stage now will be Miss Candy with an eye. Yes. Hate that bitch. And after her, at 3.15, uh, will be Miss Ebony, and then followed by Ebony will be Miss Mahogany. All right. Hey, daddy. <laughs> so what's happening, Pop? He's like... Yeah, I, you know, it was really fun having you home last week. I was like, I had a great time too. It was much so fun. Yeah. He said, but you know, I wanted to ask you a question. I'm like, what? Well, we didn't ask me, Daddy. Because I was like, no, right? He says, do you have any girlfriends? And I said, you know, Daddy, it's so crazy. I have a lot of friends who happen to be girls. And yes, that's the truth, right? I didn't lie. You my girlfriend. Then he tries to sweeten the pot. He says. You know, when I was single living in New York, I had girlfriends all over the different boroughs. I said, you did? I said, guess what? All of my girlfriends live in all the different boroughs, too? Oh, my God! How do we do this? Hold on, Pop. Thank you, Candy, with the eye. Ugh. Coming to the stage after Miss Candy will be Ebony, followed by Miss Mahogany, and then Miss Jeté. So I turn around, hey. <laughs> So, so what's really going on? He goes, you know, I'm just doing this, and he's just hemming and hawing, hemming and hawing. I'm just let, letting him go, because I'm a bitch. And so, <laughs> so he finally then says to me, he says, all right, all right, I need to know something. I go, what? Are you gay? And I said, hold on, Pop. <laughs> Coming to the stage now, thank you, Miss Ebony, followed by Miss Mahogany. Girl, you better get yourself together, because you want deck and deck. That outfit is cute. Ooh, y'all better tip her cute. She's cute. Anyway, so I turn around now, my father's laughing on the phone, right? So then he says, he says, no, I need to know. I know you should get it. And I said, all right, Pop, here's the deal. You have the option to retract this question. Uh, and he said, and I can pretend that you didn't ask, and you don't have to know the answer. Then that way it's no, you know, no skin, no foul, right? So he says, no, I need to know. I got to know. I was like, all right, Daddy, but you ain't going to be ready for this. Yes, I am gay. And he says, you, you are. I said, well, didn't you already know? Because Marvin told me you asked him. Because, yeah, I read it out my brother at the same time. That's son of a bitch! Fuck oh, oh, yeah. yeah. So that way, he knew before everybody else, right? Yeah. So then my father says to me, he says, oh, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, but you ain't do shit. This ain't got nothing to do with you. Because, see, during the process of coming out and learning about who I was, I read this fabulous book called Loving Someone Who's Gay, which I recommend to everybody who's either out of the closet and scared, thinking about coming out of the closet, or if you have someone that you love who is also gay and you need to help them through the process. And it's a really great thing. So I was already ready for the questions and the fights and the shit. You know, people are throwing it down up in here. <laughs> so my father says, hmm. Well, 
is that what you really want to do with the rest of your life? And I said, well, yeah. I said, like, that's not the only thing I do with the rest of my life, but that's just a part of it. It's like, you know, I live in New York, you live in Texas. You don't like it? That's fine with me, because you know what? And this was back during the late 90s. I could fly to Paris cheaper than I can fly to Paris, France, than I can to, to uh, Houston, Texas. So if y'all don't want me, that's cute, because Paris is very fabulous. And what I understand, when I went to Montreal, they were all about to have chunky love, so I could put that on my map, too. <laughs> like, well, you know, I mean, you know, and I was like, well, let me ask you a question. I said, do you hate me? And he goes, no, I don't hate you. I said, well, then I don't know what else to tell you because this is who I am. I said, I'm the only kid that you have out of three other kids plus the um, parental indiscretion, nudge, nudge, because he is from Latin America. Woo! Don't tell me who your father is. I tell you who your father is. Anyway. Both looking down. Anyway, so so when he he said that to me, I said, "Well, listen, you don't have to worry about me." It's like I put myself through college, I moved myself to New York City. I'm living here. I'm figuring it out. I got a job. There's naked ladies everywhere, but whatever, it's a thing. Um, and I'm here. I said, "So if you don't want me to be around, that's cool. Uh, you know, whatever." So then he puts my mother on the phone. Now my mother and I—I I grew up with my mother. My mother—I was my mother's baby. What? Her little man, just, you know, her little... <laughs> Always ready, got on a cute suit, would go to church on Sunday. Look, me and my mama. She'd make a cute dress with a hat and everything. She was not featuring that shit at all, honey. My mother cussed me out like nobody's business on that phone. And you know what happened? I cussed that bitch back, too. Yes! Oh, yes. Yes. Well, yes. Talking to me. Yes. Loud, my loud. If you want to go to the emotional grocery store and be all mad and embarrassed, that's on you, bitch. Because I'm putting pride and love up in my basket. Profound like a motherfucker, but angry as hell. Yes. How do you do that, right? So my father grabs the phone and he goes, hey, you can't talk to your mother like that. Well, she can't talk like that to me. I'm going to you. I have a brother, my brother, the one that didn't help me. And that brother has been in and out of jail for pretty much most of his life, right? <laughs> You gonna tell me you were embarrassed with the gay guy that put himself through college, who's living in New York, who's not bothering nobody, who's just trying to like get through and make people fucking laugh? You gonna be mad and embarrassed like that? But you ain't gonna be mad at the guy in jail, all right? Well, if that's how we're gonna do it, that's how we're gonna do it, right? And so my father, I taste the phone, he's like, you can't talk to him like that. Were you really calling up talking. stripper? We calling up strippers, strippers every in between in between the conversation what and so it was just like and that's like i said and in the moment when it was happening i don't remember it being as funny as it is when i retell it because right. <laughs> it, when you stop it was like i do remember when he said it's like are you gay and it was that pause and i was like hold on dad Come to the stage now. Thank you, Candy. <laughs> it's like, hold on. Let me just, you know, I've got to come out to my father. Hold on. <laughs> Do you love the irony that you're you're calling up women to be sexual, sexual on, stage. on stage while you're basically you're telling your dad that you're gay okay. over the phone? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of hilarious. The, that dichotomy of those two of things the moment, back yeah. to back. You know, and and because if I had been straight then my father would have been like, oh my God, look at you working in that place with all those naked women. And yeah, exactly. And instead it was like, oh my God, you should see the costumes they're wearing, daddy. Oh my God. She's got this bitch. <laughs> she came out with a wing. I was like, what? The props, you know? And, and he's just like, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. I just, I just don't. I think my mom saw it more as a, a betrayal of our relationship because I was her little boy. Right. I was her baby, you know? And, you know, it was a very hard thing to hear her say some of the things that she said to me. And it was even harder to respond, but I knew I had to respond. And it was like, again, thank you, Harvey Firestein, for putting that in my head to know that it's okay. That you can, you're gonna have, you're gonna have to tell your mama, bite it, sister. I'm not buying it. Right. I'm not taking it. And you're gonna have to tell your father, go fuck yourself. Like I had to do one time, and that, believe it or not, wasn't over me being gay. It was about me being overweight. What? Yes. My father tried to come for me, honey. That's an Ebony Chunky Love, the first movie. Bitch can't get a date. But he, <laughs> he, he tried it, and I responded like you would after having lived your life as long as I had been, 
doing all the things that I thought I'm supposed to be doing with my life that would at least not embarrass my family. You know what I mean? Right, like, right, right. I had a job, I was doing stuff, and then especially when I got on the radio, it's like, okay, well, look, your son is, you know, your faggot son's on the radio. You yeah. might have an issue about him being gay, but look, he's being celebrated, and people are calling in saying, what a great thing to hear, this black gay guy from wherever the hell he is from, because it sounds like me or my friends or something. Like, so it was a place for me to not be ashamed, and so it was easy to be able to cuss bitches out. Honey, like, you know, I, I tell a great story about cussing my father out. And the realization ultimately in the end is, is if you're willing to tell the people who are responsible for your <laughs> very existence on this planet to go fuck themselves because they are not treating you the way that you want to be treated or you should be treated because you're living a life that shouldn't be full of shame for them. You know what? Then you are grown. You are yeah. absolutely grown. You graduated. You to graduated. A different state of mind. Yeah, basically. and that and and like I said, like in the show, I remember saying, you know, it's like when you tell, a, it's like when you tell a motherfucker to go fuck themselves, and I say motherfucker meaning you know my actual father who fucked my mother, but like <laughs> you know when you tell that person who's fifty percent of the reason that you're actually on the planet to go fuck themselves, then there's nobody on this planet that's safe. And it was weird because after that moment, shortly thereafter, my mother had Alzheimer's. And so we never ever got to have that conversation again because I knew deep down it was just initial response. I don't hate my mama, my mom. And I know my mama loved me. But my father, he surprised me. We came closer, we started doing stuff. I used to talk to him every week on the phone, not from the strip club, but every week on the phone. <laughs> We would have conversations, and it was the most painful thing for me when, now, you know, I can't, because everybody's talking about dead family and shit, let me just throw my shit in the pile, too. <laughs> but, you know, it happens. But 11 years ago, I lost not only my mother, but I also lost my father shortly thereafter, like six weeks after. And so, it was a very strange thing, because with my father, as I said, we started to become much closer, and things were more beautiful and more wonderful, and, you know, it was really weird because, like that last week before he died, or actually before he got sick and I came back to New York and then he died, that last week we had so much fun. We buried my mother and we were like getting closer. And I finally asked that question that I've always been dying to know because my mother was 41 when she had me. 1967, if you couldn't do the math, fuck all of you. So 29. <laughs> but he, he said, to, I asked him, I said, so, man, mom was like 41. So my older brother's like six years older than me, and then the brother before that is like 15 years older than me. I was like, you know I was the accident baby. <laughs> it's like, mama got lost that night trying to grab for that diaphragm, and it just didn't make it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so he said to me, he said, no. He said, I told your mother I wanted to have another child, and that was you. And I went, wow. I was like, you just erased about, mm, at that time, 35 years of good hate. <laughs> Because at that point, you finally know, no matter what, that my father actually wanted me. Which, if you were a Latino man who has a gay son, it's like, you know, that's a lot to take on, you know what I'm saying? He used to make breakfast for me when I would come home and visit, it was fabulous. I mean, I'm sure Ricky Martin's father was that fabulous, but anyway, <laughs> it was what it was. But, one of the things about my father that I will always remember and always treasure is that when the conversations about gay marriage started to become prevalent. And he called me up one day and he said, all right, let me just tell you something right now. He says, if you show up here with some man and you're gonna tell me that this is your husband, this is your husband, daddy, this is my husband, because you know how we get indignant, right? He said, that's all right. He says, it's good to know that you're gonna have a husband. He says, but if you do have a husband, he better be rich. <laughs> Oh, funny. That man is hilarious. I mean, even that line at the end. Yeah. That and that's just one. There's he's he said he has said some things to me that have been like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> really, like, we were talking one time about uh one of my other cousins who happens to be gay. Mm -hmm. Or no, 
He, we, I think and know that he's probably gay, but everybody else is playing the, I, well, I've never seen him with a man, so I can never be sure. And he's married to a woman. And I was like, who looks like a lesbian? So <laughs> you all figure that out. He works for the government. He's trying to hide himself. <laughs> Anywho. And my father used to always say, well, you know, your cousin's very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> And then he always cracked me up. Why did you just say he's gay? He's sensitive. I was like, well, they don't say that about me, I'm sure. They probably call me all kinds of names. He goes, well, that's because that's you. (laughs) But your cousin is sensitive. Oh, my God. (laughs) But, I mean, he... He was. I was like, and I think that like my comedy came from both of my family, both of my parents, because my father was the storyteller. He could mm. tell a great story. But my mother, truthfully, though, was the one line queen. And she was like the queen of the cross. <laughs> Even though she, she never knew. She would walk through the room and hear half of the conversation and have one boom, drop the mic moment and just keep stepping. And you're like, damn, mom. Like one time she read my father. It was my favorite Favorite read. Because, you know, black people, we, we get ashy. We get ashy. It's the winter time we get ashy. And I remember my father was sitting in the room with a pair of shorts and, you know, looked like he'd been kicking flowers, like they say. And my mother walked into the room and she was just like, da 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 She walked by. She said, ooh, Price, your legs look so, so dry. They look like ice. Right? <laughs> and so she leaves and walks to the room and then it was just like, what does she mean it looks like ice? And you stop, and then I looked at a piece of ice, and I was like, oh, mama, that was a read, mama, that was a read, you better get it, girl, you know? And, and it was always things like that, like, or, I remember when she was talking about my brother, and she'd said that, uh, you know, my brother, older brother was the trouble brother, right? So he was the one that's always getting in trouble and everything. And so she was with my godmother one time, and they were having, like, their old Honduras girl chats, and they were saying, my mother says, well, you know, the Bible says that you should bend the tree when it's young so that it'll grow in the way that you want to. And my mother said, I've been trying to bend Marvin ever since he was a child. I bent him, I twisted him, I turned him, and still he grew up crooked. And it's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. First of all, it's my mother talking about my brother in front of me, so I'm loving the read. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right, like, of course. Ah. That's what I've been saying. Um, <laughs> so she, but, I mean, but she would be quick to just... And keep going. Or one time when we were in the nursing home, I'll never forget it. It was so funny. It was like the first few weeks that she was in a nursing home. And so she was in and out of being coherent a lot of times. Mm-hmm. So my father was like, here, let's go walk your mom around the floor because she likes to walk. And I was like, okay, great. So my father gets <laughs> on one side of my mother and I'm on the other side. And we have the walker. She's holding on to the walker, but she's got her head down. And so she's kind of like just not in the zone. And so my father was like... All right, be careful now. When we walk through the hall, you know, your mother always bumps into stuff. And so we have to be careful when she's walking. We don't want her to hit her toe on the thing. We don't want her to do this. We don't do this. And then all of a sudden, my mother just looked up and she looked at me and she looked at my father. She goes, what are you going to do? Tell him my whole story? And then she just like kind of zipped right out. And then we started walking. And I screamed with laughter because that shit was hilarious. She's just like, what are you going to do? Tell him my whole story? And she just went back. I was like, oh my God. Caddy to the end, honey. But it was, like I said, the, they, they did fuel me. So my mom was the, the one-liner and my daddy was the, the storyteller. And I think... I managed to get both of those skills, which is why whenever you hear me do a set, it's never really just like, hey, set up, punch, joke, boom. It's always a story that has these funny one-line moments in them. And that's kind of, I think, God, it's good. That's I was like, that's the homage to my parents. That is. <laughs> but I mean, that's, I mean, I think it's how your set always is. And it's so brilliant that you're a perfect marriage of both your mom and your dad. So thank, thank you to them. For this amazing gift of Keith Price. Aww. And thank you for doing this podcast because you, well, you are hysterical. And I just want to talk about the three things that we learned from Keith Price today. What did you learn? We've learned that meeting your idols can always be a good thing, sure. not always a bad thing. Not always a bad thing. You're right. Uh, number two, a strip club's a great place to learn about your own sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> As a gay Very man and a straight one. <laughs> And the third thing is, is that Keith Price will always be 
his daddy's little princess, oh. <laughs> which is amazing. So thank you again, Keith. Thank, thank you, thank you for doing Closet Cases. Guys, make sure you guys subscribe on iTunes. Oh. We have another show coming up this Sunday at the Legendary Stonewall Inn, and it's featuring amazing people. We have Ames Beckerman. We have Adolfo Blair. We have Claudia Kogan, Calvin Cato. We have uh, Kara Kilduff, and of course, yours truly, Sean Hollenbach. Oh, well. Yes. I have not seen her in at least three years. Well, you Easily. need to see her this Sunday yeah. down at the Stonewall. And thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure you share, follow us on, on Instagram, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And guys, just as you always know, remember when you first came out, it was dramatic then, but isn't it hilarious now? Thank you guys so much.